I invite the congregation to please stand as you're able. We gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The gift of grace in Jesus Christ, the reconciling love of God, and the life and peace of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And please join me as we pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you hate nothing you have made, and you forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and honest hearts, so that truly repenting of our sins, we may receive from you the God of all mercy, full pardon and forgiveness, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Friends in Christ, every year at the time of our Lord Jesus Christ's Passover from death to life, with the church throughout the world, we celebrate our redemption from sin, death, and the devil. Lent is a time to renew our life in the paschal mystery of Jesus' death and resurrection, in which we participate through the sacramental life of the church. It is also a time to prepare candidates for baptism. We begin this holy season by acknowledging our need for repentance and for the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We show our resolve to amend our lives with a sign of ashes, which speak of our mortality and symbolize our repentance. And so I invite you, therefore, to observe a holy Lent, committing yourselves to self-examination and penitence, prayer and fasting, almsgiving and works of love, and to attend to the word of God and receive the sacraments of Christ as we journey together through these 40 days to the great three days of Jesus' death and resurrection. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess to you that we and to one another that before the whole company of heaven, that we have sinned by our own fault, by our own fault, by our own most grievous fault, in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. We have shut our ears to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, O God. Our past unfaithfulness, the pride, the envy, the hypocrisy, the apathy that have infected our lives, we confess to you. Have mercy. Our self-indulgent appetites and ways, and our exploitation of other people, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Our negligence in prayer and worship, and our failure to share the faith that is in us, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Our neglect of human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, o God. Our false judgments, our uncharitable thoughts towards our neighbors, our prejudice and contempt toward those who differ from us, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, o God. Our waste and pollution of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us, we confess to you. Restore us, O God, and let your anger depart from us. As we come forward for the imposition of ashes, um, we'll have two stations. Uh, we just ask you to come forward as you uh, 
and we will um, we will impart those to you. And let us pray. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. May these ashes be a sign of our mortality and our penitence, reminding us that only by the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ are we given eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Glenn, remember that you are dust. It's a dust.
please stand as we conclude our confession on page six, or page five, I'm sorry, bottom of page five. Accomplish in us, O God, the work of your salvation. By the cross and passion of your Son, our Savior. Bring us with all your saints to the joy of his resurrection. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading is from Joel, the second chapter. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Render your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relents from punishing. Who knows? whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the aged. Gather the children, even infants, at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading is from 2 Corinthians, the 5th and 6th chapters. We entreat you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of the righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown, and yet are well known as dying. And see, we are alive as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. This is the word of the Lord. to the seed of your word. 
Lord, let my heart be good soil, where love and peace and peace is understood. For it is hard. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And more than any sermon I could possibly preach this night, more than any hymn that we might possibly sing, more than any conversation that we might keep, this is a day that is marked and marred mostly by dust. My guess is that if anything happens in worship tonight, it's the in position of ashes, as we like to call it, that is what you will remember the most as we begin our Lenten journey today. After all, what kind of journey in life that we journey forth in commences with such a raw and direct confrontation with our mortality as human beings? What kind of journey begins with such a blunt reminder of human brokenness, of sin, of limitation? I don't know of many journeys that begin that way except this one. And for some of us, perhaps the word dust signals more than just a reminder that we are from stardust in which we were created and that one day we shall return. For me, this is personal. For me, this is something confrontational and real and raw in those ancient words. Especially as I grow older 
and have more life experiences. And yet, on the most basic of levels, when I hear those ancient words, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Not only am I reminded that I am a human being, but I am reminded of what I am not. I'm not God. And I'm reminded once again that I'm powerless against the forces of this world that rage around us. Or perhaps the long, cold winter in which we've endured. After all, I think dust reminds us of that most innate and primal way that you and I ultimately don't have control. That we possess no special powers per se. No final means to save ourselves in a world of life and death that churns around us. Friends, this is how our 40-day Lenten journey begins, like it or not. And I won't sugarcoat the reality that we've been gathered once again on worship on a day like this, to be told once again that we are nothing but D-U-S-T, dust. And I can't minimize that as disciples we have been called to embrace this four-letter word as it's marked conspicuously now on our forehead and itched, etched into our very souls. It's inscribed right here, plain as day exposed for all of the world to see. And yet, we gather and we're not ashamed of such markings. Those ashes are not placed upon us somehow as a marker to remind us again of how intolerable or unlovable we are. No, not at all. After all, that dust has been made in the shape of a cross. And that cross signals finally that we, as we might seem to the world fallible and finite and fallen, we are seen by God as forgiven and freed and formed in His image. That's what that cross means. And that cross on our foreheads that all of the world sees, remember, is traced over that very one place on your forehead that was traced and marked with the cross of Christ in the waters of baptism as you were anointed by the Holy Spirit. And it reminds you that you are a beloved child of God through His everlasting love, dust, and all. And still I wonder, when we hear those ancient words of Jesus, those words that are buried right there in Matthew's Gospel from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, if we are truly ready to face a reality of just what this Lenten journey means in our lives, Are we truly ready to get back to the basics of what that Lenten journey entails for our life of faith? The truth for me is that I somehow never seem quite ready for the words that we hear Jesus dish out and those words that seem to kick off our Lenten journey. And the problem with Lent seems to be encapsulated in those words that Jesus speaks on that mountain. And when you fast, he says, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces as to show others that they are fasting. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And I don't need to read again the entire verse, the entire scripture. You get the point. After all, the demand to fast, to die to ourselves, 
is counterintuitive of everything that we know in this world of the world that teaches us. And accustomed this world is to denying things like dust on our foreheads. These words are countercultural to a world that would rather have us accumulate things and feast and hoard things for ourselves as individuals. To fast, Jesus says. And yet this is what the discipline of Lent demands of us who walk yet by faith to die to the self. It's part of what these ashes on our forehead remind us of. To be honest, as we begin this season of Lent, it doesn't sound like much fun, does it? Or as Reverend David Lowe suggests, quote, the trouble with Lent is that it feels like this strange, weirdly anachronistic holiday that celebrates things we don't value and encourages attitudes that we don't share. That's because it asks of us to give things up. And haven't you and I given up enough? We've given of our time and our schedules. We've given our sacrifice at work or in our careers or in our neighborhoods. We've given our money and our patience. We've given ourselves all over the place for the sake of this world. Some of us give so much because we struggle to make ends meet. Some of us who are parents run around like crazy people getting our kids to games and appointments. And grandparents do as well. And we try our darndest to save for a rainy day. This world teaches us to worry, to fret, to complain. This world teaches us that we have given up enough. And now we're asked to fast. And it's Lent. And perhaps that just doesn't seem like that much fun, does it? But maybe Lent in this season of 40 days is exactly what you and I need in our lives. After all, could it be that when these ashes are placed on our foreheads for all of the world to see, and I hope that you don't wash these ashes off immediately when you get home. It could it be that we are actually with these ashes placed on our foreheads, taking a stand against the world around us and claiming a sacred space for our relationship with God. Could it be that when those ashes are placed on our foreheads that we get to die now to all of those worries and anxieties that somehow we always seem to create for ourselves anyway in order to take up Christ's cross and live out our baptism? And could it be that when those ashes sometimes dripping down our noses if I got you good enough. Can it be that sometimes those ashes remind us that dying isn't all that bad after all? Because death, remember, does not have the last say. It reminds us that God has something more in store for your life. And could it be that in dying and fasting to the stuff of this beautiful, yes, but crazy world that we are offered something much more valuable in return? Perhaps time and space to pray, to focus, to slow it down just a little bit and to focus on our relationships with our neighbors, and with God. That's what these ashes call us to do. And as we begin our Lenten journey marked and marred with this sacred dust, maybe we are called not so much to see Lent as a fast of sacrifice, 
but rather to see Lent as a gift of God to feast upon. Or in the words of Arthur, Arthur Lichtenberg, to fast from judgment and feast on compassion. To fast from greed and to feast on sharing. To fast from scarcity and to feast on abundance. To fast from fear and to feast on peace. To fast from lies and to feast on the truth. To fast from gossip and feast instead on praise. To fast from anxiety and feast on patience. To fast from evil and feast upon kindness. To fast from apathy and feast on engagement. To fast from discontent and to feast on gratitude. To fast from noise and to feast on silence to fast from discouragement and feast on hope, to fast from hatred and to feast on the everlasting love of God. Tonight you have been marked by the cross of Christ. What will be your fast to this world in order that you might feast on the gifts of the Lord? Amen. I invite you to rise as you are able, as we join together as God's, God's people, to confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Seeking the grace, the mercy, the love of Almighty God, we offer our prayers for the church, for people in need, and for all of creation.
Holy and righteous God, teach us, your church, to be honest about our sinfulness. Turn our hearts back to you to receive the fullness of your forgiveness and your redemption. Hear us, O God. Open wide your heart, hand to satisfy the needs of every, every living thing. Send your spirit to places suffering from drought and floods. Fill every habitat with life. Hear us, O God. Raise up reconcilers who point us to the sources of injustice and teach us how to build relationships. Establish your lasting peace among the nations. Hear us, O God. Soothe the souls of people who feel like they are beyond your mercy, especially those whom we name in our hearts before you. Wash away the barriers that keep us far from you and restore joy in our lives. Hear us, O God. Fill our, last, our fasting bodies with your spirit of justice. Lead us into the challenging work of feeding and freeing all people. Fulfill your purpose in us. Hear us, O God. Reveal the treasures of heaven through the witness of all your saints. Give us the will to journey faithfully and to bear Christ's salvation to all who yearn for it. Hear us, O God. Reveal your will as you receive our prayers and conform our ways to your ways through the saving work of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us join in sharing the gift of our Lord's peace. We continue our worship by sharing our gifts and our offerings.
Generous God, you feed us with the harvest of the land, and you provide for our every need. Receive our gifts of money, imagination, and labor, and transform them into a feast that welcomes all. In Jesus Christ, our host and our guest. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, O God of the universe. Your mercy is everlasting and your faithfulness endures from age to age. Praise to you for creating the heavens and the earth. Praise to you for saving the earth from the waters of the flood. Praise to you for bringing the Israelites safely through the sea. Praise to you for leading your people through the wilderness to the land of milk and honey. Praise to you for the words and deeds of Jesus, your anointed one. Praise to you for the death and resurrection of Christ. Praise to you for your spirit poured out on all nations. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. With this bread and this cup, we remember our Lord's Passover from death to life as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. O God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Bless this feast. Grace our table with your presence. Come, Holy Spirit. Reveal yourself in the breaking of the bread. Raise us up at the, as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us. Send us forth, burning with justice, with peace, and with love. With your holy ones and all of all times and all places, with earth and all its creatures, with sun and moon and stars, we praise you, O God, blessed and holy trinity, now and forever. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The table is prepared for us. Come, let us feast.
strength and courage. But the journey ahead during this time is easy. So if that's easy. Let us pray. Merciful Father, accompany our journey through these 40 days. Renew us in the gift of baptism, that we may provide for those who are poor, pray for those in need, fast from the... And above all, may we find the treasure of life in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now God, who fills creation with abundance, and Christ, who spreads his arms in forgiveness, and the Holy Spirit, who draws ever close to us, bless you and bring you to eternal life. Amen.
Let us go forth now into the world to serve God with gladness, to be of good courage, to hold fast to that which is good, to render to no one evil for evil, to strengthen the faint-hearted, to support the weak, to help the afflicted, to honor all people, to love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God.